We'll be looking at 1 Kings 9 and 10. Why? I don't know. It should say 10, uh, 14 through... Uh, <laughs> it should say 10, 14 through uh, 11, I think. Uh, 12, I think. It's all right as long as we got the right ones up there. Yeah, that'll work. I just put the wrong, uh, or failed to put the correct numbers in there. It should say 1 Kings 10, 14 through 12, although we really won't get to 12 tonight. Uh, and it shouldn't be a warning, a gift, and a visit. I must have forgot to change all that. I thought I'd changed it, but I didn't. It should say... Uh, opulence, corruptive women, and fracture. That's what it should say. Opulence, corruptive women, and fracture. That basically describes in uh, topical detail what we'll be covering in 1 Kings 10, 14 through 11 and 12. So uh, we'll be looking at that tonight. Uh, before we get there, let's take time to pray. What kind of prayer requests are on your heart tonight? Sorry. What was the name? Sebastian, Sebastian Warmington. I'm sorry. Well, be praying for Phoenix. Uh, he's in camp. And as far as we know, he's doing good. I talked to Penny uh, Cox down there at camp, and she is thinking he's doing good on Monday. And so she hasn't called me. I think everything's going great. So uh, keep praying for them. I, I just found her, her sort of a response to uh, somebody that came in, some kids that came in that were going to be leading in worship. So invigorating, you know. She just said, I think we're just going to have a powerful week, you know. And I love that attitude that just says, you know, great things are going to happen. Let's pay attention to the Lord and uh, we'll watch. And then. Uh, so excited about that. So camp is upon us, actually been upon us for already. They've had at least one camp. Um, so be praying about that. We've got, that's one from us. And then we've got six more that are registered. And you never know. I mean, there's uh, several other kids that might decide to go. And if they do at last minute, hey, we'll, we'll see to it they get there. So uh, it's a great experience uh, for, for young ones. So be praying for that, that it'd be great for, really great for uh, Phoenix and, uh, of course, for the rest of the children that will go later on. Pray for a lot of safety lately. We need to keep praying for that. We've got a vacation Bible school coming soon. Uh, so we want to be praying for vacation Bible school. Uh, Sandy, is this the first time you've done the... Okay, so Sandy is director for her first time of a vacation Bible school, so be praying for her, uh, that God will give a lot of peace and confidence, and uh, I, I just praise the Lord that you had the, the courage to step out and say, I can do that, so thank you, glad for it. Uh, anybody else got a prayer request that you want to add to our list? How's your new job going? One day, is this day one? Second. Second day. Second day. All right. Uh, April is a new Walmart employee. So uh, you're at Monette? Yes. All right. So at Monette uh, Walmart. Very good. Hey, what's going on there? How are you doing, Al Davis? I'm good. Pretty good. 
All right. Good to see you here. I'm still upright. <laughs> That's a good place. Keep going. All right. Any prayer requests that we need to cover? Any more? Going once, going twice? Let's pray. Great God, our Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for being able to come into the place that we've dedicated to worship you in, to learn in and to grow in, a place where we've decided to be reverent uh, in. I pray that you'll help us to let that word soak in and sink in for us just a little bit more and more in our lives. I sometimes feel like it's an attitude that's almost disappeared. I pray, Father, that you would help us to re review it, uh, bring it out of the bin, dust it off, put it on our uh, shoulders and wear it because it really needs to be us. We pray, Father, that you would bless us tonight as we're gathered tonight thinking about your, your scriptures. We ask to be guided when we come to them and uh, we ask to be made attentive so that we can really get it, get what's there and let it matter to us. Help us to understand the connection, the Christ connection that's there in all the scripture. Uh, Father, we do pray for these that uh, have come before us tonight, especially uh, Sebastian Warmington's family. It is so shocking and so sad that a young one doesn't get to live out the re remainder of his days, but is taken so early. So we, we know how terrible, empty that must be for his family. And we just pray for them and our heart aches for them. We pray that you hearing our ache, feeling our ache with us will turn it into comfort somehow for them that they might understand and have come closer to you and have felt your presence more and have had the, the time and the horrible loss bought back somehow by your presence and your comfort and your ministry to their life. Father, we do pray for those who are in camp now. Uh, we thank you that Phoenix was able to go. We pray that you would protect him and keep him as he's there. Please prepare each child of ours, especially that is going yet, all the children, but they're our children, so we pray for them especially. So you'll protect them, keep them, cause them to find great riches in your son as they go to camp. Please be with our vacation Bible school plans, all those things that are going on. Bless uh, Sandy as she continues to work and to uh, strive to bring about a really great offering to uh, our community. We pray that our community will respond, that they'll send many children to us and that we will be able to do an, an awesome job of instructing, loving, and uh, uh, helping them along in, in life and uh, help them go from us uh, excited and innovative and ready to serve you. Father, we pray again that you bless us tonight. We thank you so many, so much for the the, the things that you give us, the life that you give us, this country, all that's ours in it. We pray that you will help us to be part of its preservation and uh, part of the, the onwardness of it, uh, the betterment of it. We pray, Father, that you will help us to understand how awesome and grand you are. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, of course, again, this is uh, the wrong title. It should be, uh, again, Opulence, Corruptive Women, and Fracture in 1 Kings 10, 14 through uh, 12. Uh, so 1 Kings 10, 14 is where we begin. Now the weight of gold which came into Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Is that a familiar number? Yes, it is. Where is that number from? Where do you know it from? Mark the Mark of the Beast. The Mark of the Beast? You think it's Nero. Uh, well, I just guess when I look at this, look at the passage, I'm just going to share this with you. I'm not asking you to go look at the passage. It's in Revelations 13, I think about the 18th verse, somewhere like that, if you want to look it up. 
Uh, but I find John's sort of disquiet with city and with the development of government uh, on earth uh, kind of fascinating in connection with this number and this passage. I'm not too sure that John didn't want to reflect you back to this passage and get you thinking about King Solomon. Because here in 1 Kings 10, 14, we're going to talk about the opulence of King Solomon right here. But everything from here on for King Solomon is downhill. Okay? So do know that. Be aware of that. Uh, that's one of the things that happens sometimes when you get the great opulence. Or So far, I think we're batting about 1,000 on that. Uh, when you get the great opulence, then your, your uh, civilization tends to tumble in. Uh, we've done per, a little bit better with the uh, English and Western civilization. But uh, right now, well, we'll just see how it turns out. Verse 15, besides that, so let's start again. Now the weight of gold which came into Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Besides that from the traders and the wares of the merchants and all the kings of the Arabs and the governors of the country. So he was charging lots of money. King Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold using 600 shekels of gold on each large shield. Uh, he made 300 shields of beaten gold using three minas of gold on each shield, and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. <coughs> Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with refined gold. There were six steps to the throne and a round top to the throne at its rear and arms on each side of the seat and two lions standing beside the arms. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps on the one side, and on the other, nothing like it was made for any other kingdom. And I don't know how well you'll be able to see this picture, but if you think about that beautiful sort of grand uh, scene, uh, there have been many painters try to make do justice with it, and I'm not sure that any have, but uh, I've put this in front of you. There's another one that's very favorite to me that I decided not to show tonight. Instead, we'll be looking at this one. And uh, you can see your lions stacked up there, one step upon the other, and uh, kind of a round throne at the back, so round top to the throne. So it's a, an effort to show you the grandeur of what Solomon built. Now it says, all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. You had to be kind of almost strong, I guess, to get a drink. <laughs> weighty, weighty vessels to, to drink from. Uh, this is a, a view of the temple area, and uh, I wanted to just kind of point out what they're saying is the house of the forest of Lebanon here before we went on. Uh, there must have been a grand house here, and uh, that's, that's what the artist's guess, best guess is of its placement. And of course, this would be uh, back in here with this small uh, wall would enclose the temple proper. And then this is sort of a grand uh, plaza area where people could enter and come near to the temple. So, and then I'm not too sure why they made this tall of an edifice here because I don't really remember it being quite that tall. So there's some things that are probably objectionable about it, but uh, that they went ahead and tried to give you some feel for the city I think is a good thing. It helps you to kind of understand uh, what, a, what a big deal had been done uh, by King Solomon uh, to present people to a worship place in Jerusalem. None was of silver, that is, of the table service. None was of silver. It was not considered valuable in the days of Solomon. For the king had at sea the ships of Tarshish with the ships of Hiram. Once every three years, the ships of Tarshish came bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes 
and peacocks. And part of my reason, again, for wanting to mention uh, 666 in connection with this passage is when you read from uh, John's revelation, he's, he, when he starts talking about people are upset about things that are happening, he says, woe to the ships at sea and all of the merchants and uh, on and on like that. And it's just this kind of stuff. But I want to make mention to you before we go further that uh, this is the shipping that we've been talking about that is going back and forth be between uh, this part. We're not sure, I'm not really sure where the, the port is down here. It could have been Joppa, it could have been Gaza. Uh, but up here, it's Tyre and Sidon. And then on up the way is uh, Tarshish. So that's, that they were trading back and forth by ships. Uh, and and uh, Solomon had uh, become quite the quite the trade mogul, and uh, people were really uh, getting involved in that part of the country. So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. All the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. They brought every man his gift, articles of silver and gold, garments, weapons, spices, horses and mules, so much year by year. So Solomon, now Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, and he stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. So throughout this uh, empire that he's uh, developing, uh, he will have... Uh, every now and then he'll have a city and he'll put chariots and horses in it. Uh, that way uh, he stands at the ready uh, in case he should need them. And I don't know how he would have placed them strategically. Our uh, writer doesn't bother to mention that. The king made silver as common as stones in Jerusalem and he made cedars as plentiful as sycamore trees that are in the lowland. Now this would be like uh, I would take it as kind of like any tree that you and I might see along the creek today. Uh, it's that common. Uh, the that, and he made cedars that common. It's plentiful. But I have this question. Is this an exercise in hyperbole? I think so, probably, to a certain extent. Uh, by hyperbole, hyperbole is like you, you overemphasize something. You say it actually... Hyperbole, strictly speaking, means you throw too far. Uh, so you overthrow a thing to make a point. Uh, I think probably it is a little bit. And so I'm asking this question, what about the cedars? Does he actually mean uh, trees? Or he's talking about the lumber from them? My suggestion is that he means the lumber from them. Uh, takes a long time to grow a really strong cedar tree, especially one of the sort that they were probably harvesting. Uh, it's thought that they may have been harvesting a tree not unlike the redwoods and that they're just all gone now. Uh, and that's why you don't see them up there on those uh, hills anymore. Uh, also, Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt and Kue, and uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. That's how I'm pronouncing it. Kue and the king's merchants procured them from Kue for a price. And uh, Kue is right up in this neck of the woods. Can you see my red dot? Okay, here's Tyre. My red dot's on Tyre. Now follow it up here. Right in here is Kue. Can you see my red dot? All right, I heard the response. All right, it's from QA. So he's got horses from, from Egypt and QA. So he's getting basically horses from two different directions, down in this area uh, and then up here in this area. So uh, he's importing a lot of horses. Interesting, uh, when you read in your Old Testament uh, up to the point of, uh, of uh, Solomon, you never really get the feeling that there are a lot of horses. You, 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 you have more the understanding that 
pretty much the way you got around was on foot. And uh, when Solomon comes along, this horse thing gets to be a big deal, and he's bringing them in. The Israelites are becoming horsemen, and uh, uh, so they've got a lot of, of uh, horse, horses coming into that area. Big, important development. It makes you much more powerful uh, militarily if you can uh, have a cavalry, basically. A chariot was imported from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver, and a horse for 150. So it gives you the price. This is what apparently Solomon was paying to get the animals and the, and the chariots. So you know, do your math there. Uh, a chariot is worth four horses. It takes two of them or one of them to draw it, probably one. And by the same means they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and to the kings of the Arameans. So they're manufacturing, Egypt is, they're manufacturing weapons down here essentially, and they're, they're sending these weapons up into, into Solomon's region here. And then Solomon is continuing to trade up here with the Hittites and the Arameans. So uh, he, he's making money, lots of it. Uh, I imagine that was only the incoming price I don't think it's what he actually ended up with for money when he got done trading. Uh, 1 Kings 11. Now is where we really see the decline. Uh, 1 Kings 11. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. So if you start tracking around, you know, you got Moabites down here, the Ammonites, and the Hittites are on up here, and just everywhere, the, the man's finding some woman that he's attracting uh, or attracted to, and so he's, he says that he loved them. Fascinating. From the nations concerning, uh, back up and read it in context. Uh, so, now King Solomon loved many foreign women with the daughter of Pharaoh from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. It is fairly difficult for me to wrap my head around trying to know 1,000 women. It's just kind of not realistic. Uh, and yet, somehow he was attached to them. Somehow he was connected to them. There was a connection between them and him. And uh, they were able to communicate with him. It becomes obvious here in a few minutes. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods. Now Solomon had a 40-year uh, run as a, as a king. So by the time he's uh, uh, died, he's probably in his 60s. Uh, so when he's older, as he approaches the time of his end, I don't know. I guess he just lets them have his, their way with him. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Now, the Sidonian, the Ashtoreth, is up here in, along this seacoast. That's where the Ashtoreth, or should say perhaps the Ashtoreth, that's the plural of Ashtoreth, 
uh, the Astaroth uh, were worshipped. And apparently what best people can work out was that she functioned as some sort of consort uh, to the Baal over in, uh, that's worshipped over in, in the other side in this area over here in Moab and Ammon and down in here. So uh, this is a terrible kind of worship. It's, it's uh, been detected that uh, the worship involved a kind of, a, well, things that let's just say you wouldn't do. Uh, and certainly something that Solomon had no business as a Hebrew doing. And yet this is what he went after. Uh, Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Uh, then Solomon built a high place. You know, it's one thing to get involved in their worship and it's horrible, that's, that's terrible. But Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab. This is another god that uh, uh, we'll, I'll detail in just a minute. Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab on the, on the mountain, which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. And if you back up, you can again see uh, let's see, where are we? Moab and Ammon. We're still down in this area talking about their gods down in this area. Moab and Ammon. Uh, so uh, these gods are just right terrible. I mean, uh, Chemosh in one account in, a, in Scripture that will, uh, I think we, we are yet to come to it. Uh, one of the uh, potentates uh, over there in the uh, Moab area is appealing to Chemosh with all his might because the Israelites are about to attack and overcome them. And he's uh, all beat up, so he goes up on the wall of his city and he sacrifices his son on the wall of the city. Terrible stuff. And uh, Molech is actually worse. Uh, Molech is a god that uh, people sacrifice little babies to. And uh, I won't go into the details. You guys have enough imagination, but uh, if you want to ask me after, I'll talk to you about it. But uh, it's terrible. It's, oh, it's just horrible, horrible stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, terribly off-put by it. Uh, but I have to, I have to say that I'm a little concerned about my country, not a little, quite an awful lot concerned about my country, in that we kind of look at something like that and we just think it's the worst thing in the world. And yet we have legislators now that are attempting to make it all right to take a child's life before birth, right <coughs> up to birth and even after. And it just doesn't seem to me like we're all that much better. Uh, so think, uh, consider, and allow God to wash us with his presence and his mind and teach us what's right and righteous in this because I, I, think, it's a, I think it's worth your reflection I really don't know that I want to push it any further than that tonight, but I just want you to think about it uh, to, to see if somehow or another we're better, perhaps not as good. But in any case, it's a, it's a terrible practice. Uh, here we are with uh, my picture of Jerusalem, and I don't know why. Oh, yes. Uh, right here we go. Uh, Solomon built the high place for Chemosh, the detestable of idol, uh, of idol of Moab on the mountain, which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detest detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. So if you go here to this uh, picture, this is a picture of 
of uh, an uh, artist rendering of the city of Jerusalem. And uh, way back here is the palace and the temple. And down here is what's called the city of David. We'll use this again yet tonight because there's another issue that comes up in a little bit. But uh, this is the western hill here. So over here on that side of things is where he would have established a, uh, some kind of a shrine to these gods. And uh, you know Solomon, I don't expect it was small. It says, thus also he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So, you know, <laughs> the way uh, a lot of people who think about and write about this kind of a thing in religion, they call this syncretism. It means that you're trying to draw from many faiths and, you know, ball, ball them all up and take from this and that. And, you know, then you've got whatever it is you've got. Uh, to me, it's just a big mess. And uh, you, you completely destroy any thought of power uh, of the living God walking amongst you and wanting to change your hearts and minds and help you to become what you should be in Him. That's, that's, not, that's not part of it. Uh, it's more like in a, uh, I'm just, I'm just uh, taking this little will that I know that is within me to, to worship. I should be worshiping. I feel I ought. I feel I have this spiritual sense about things that I, something else there. And so I just make this stuff up. And I begin to worship and make up meaning and uh, know that somehow sacrifice is present, but totally without any revealed knowledge uh, from the God. It's all guesswork and horrible guesswork at that. Uh, now it says the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. What do you think the author's opinion of Solomon is? I get Crumb. this. What's that? Crumb. Crumb. <laughs> yeah. Now, I like our author a great deal because there's a certain gladness and almost a sort of quiet pride in the, in the way he talks about what Solomon achieved. But when it comes time to sort of make the case against Solomon, he doesn't stop. He doesn't hold back. He just goes right ahead and tells you precisely as it is. And uh, basically aligns uh, the, uh, the accusations with, with evidence properly to, uh, uh, to, 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 to make you think about Solomon correctly. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yeah. Not, merely, not merely your son or maybe some distant relative or, uh, but, and, and not even to an enemy, but, but somebody that's in your own house. I'm going to give a servant to your kingdom. Nevertheless, he says to him, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. So I want to talk, I, I meant to put a note in there, so I'm going to stop right there. How, what do we mean here? Nevertheless, I will do it in the days, it, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. I, I, don't, I don't quite... Help me make sense of that. God respected David? Yes. Okay. <coughs> David and Bathsheba paid the blood price for their sin, but Solomon did not. Okay. His son would have to pay. Okay.
Okay, I just want you to think about that. Why, why does it say, for the sake of your father David? I find it fascinating. I, I have a sense of it, but I'm not sure I'd do a great job of, of correctly putting it together logically. Uh, in any case, I do feel the understanding of it. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. In other words, I guess when I look at it and I say, well, yeah, I get it. It's a respecting for David. But Why? David's gone. Maybe he has more respect for him. Sorry? He followed after his ways. Too. What's that? David followed after the Lord and did what he told him to do. Okay. He didn't respect him. Yeah. What was that, Al? I said David was a man after God's own heart. David was a man after God's own heart. Did stuff. Like all this stuff, just keep uh, putting it in, in the mill and letting it mix together. Um, not sure I'm going to give you an answer, <laughs> but it's somewhere out there like what you're the, saying. Yes. Uh, Mike, in, in chapter, I mean, verse 11, it says your subordinates, and in 12, it says your son. Okay, let's see. Go. Uh, Lord, so the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Servant. Uh, nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. So when God does this, he doesn't do it during Solomon's time. He does it the next generation. And, and God's God. He gets to do what he wants to do. And I think I, there's a sense in which I understand it. But to be honest, I don't, I don't quite fully understand it. <laughs> Why didn't he just smack David uh, Solomon down, you know, and say, "Bud, that was a bad choice." <laughs> well, <laughs> but he didn't. Wasn't it a, 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 a thing that when, when the king was in in, in our, his his family. Yeah, that's, that's typically what you would do. Is it, it, he, and in fact, it was his son Rehoboam that comes to the throne, and we'll read about that. But um, he, he doesn't get to keep it. Uh, I will give you a little bit of what I see in this. Um, I see a kind of reality and a, a, a way of talking to you about life in the next generation. You live your life in a particular way and insist on it, your children will suffer. And you may not like that, but you can check it out. It's not hard to see. You might live a good life. Kids will. There you go. That's, that's partly what I see in it, that God lets that play out so that you can see it and it becomes a warning to you that look, get it turned around in your lifetime. If, if, if there's repenting has to be done, let's make it happen now while we're still living. And then, you know, children will turn out as they are and, and we ourselves, as we go to our rest, we, we will at least know this, that we, we straighten out what we had before God. And uh, that's, that's what we need to be doing. It's what we need to, that's part of what I pray for, is repentance, that the people of America, particularly in the world in general, will begin to see that, you know, I haven't been uh, as sold out to God as I could be, and I want to do that. I want to make that happen in my life. So uh, that's, that's hopefully what people come to. Then the Lord raised up an adversary to Solomon, Hadad the Edomite, he was the royal line in, of the royal line in Edom. Now, I referenced uh, Rehoboam, but we're not talking about him yet. So understand that, this, this, that when he says the Lord raised up an adversary to Solomon, he's actually on the front end of a list, okay? Hadad's just the first guy. 
He was of the royal line in Edom, and of course Edom is down here. If I keep pointing to it, eventually we're going to know it. It's down here south of the Dead Sea. Uh, a lot of it's over there in those mountains on the uh, our right-hand side there uh, of the southern part below the Dead Sea. For it came about, what's that? I thought somebody said something. For it came about when David was in Edom, and Joab, the commander of the army, had gone up to bury the slain and had struck down every male in Edom. For Joab and all Israel stayed there six months until he had cut off every male in Edom. Uh, that Hadad, Hadad fled to Egypt, he and, a certain, and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him, while Hadad was a young boy. So uh, what you have is David coming down uh, in here with Joab and his army, and they rout all the Edomites out of here. And, uh, of course, they are there for six months. They're uh, sort of like an occupational force. They're just standing in there. And if they find an Edomite male while they're there, they kill him. So they were wiping him out. Well, somehow this guy survives, hey dad does, and uh, escapes and gets out of there. Uh, he flees to Egypt while he's still a young boy. They arose from Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them from Paran and came to Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house and assigned him food and gave him land. So Pharaoh treated him as a refugee that needed probably a political one that needed help and maybe might come to service sometime uh, because he's a neighbor to King Solomon who's growing more and more powerful. So uh, the Pharaoh says, hey, you can, you can stay here and, and get uh, sort of tuned up for the next phase of your life. And uh, right down here is the land of Paran and then on down in here is Egypt. So that's where he fled to is from Egypt, uh, Edom, and then on down to Egypt. Uh, now, Hadad found great favor before Pharaoh, so that he gave him in marriage the sister of his own wife, the sister of Tapenes, the queen, the sister of, we don't know her name, but we know her sister's name. <laughs> the sister of Tapenes bore him, bore his son Genubah, whom Tapenes weaned in Pharaoh's house. So there's the connection for Tapenes. Not just that she's sister, but that she actually brings this child up in Pharaoh's house. It's a big development, really. You remember Moses? He was brought up in Pharaoh's house. Uh, you get an education if you go to Pharaoh's house. You learn something. You learn to be. And uh, so that's the kind of thing that's happening uh, with, with uh, Hadad and uh, his children, uh, Genubath. And Genubath was in Pharaoh's house among the sons of Pharaoh. But when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers and that Joab, the commander of the army, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, send me away that I may go to my own country. So I'm a little off there earlier. I said something about Solomon becoming stronger. It's David who was becoming stronger. And uh, Pharaoh was sort of hedging his bets, I think, in part by uh, uh, fostering somebody who is a neighbor rival, possibly a neighbor rival to uh, that kingdom growing up there between David and Solomon. Then Pharaoh said to him, but what have you lacked with me that behold you are seeking to go to your own country? And he answered, nothing. Nevertheless, you must surely let me go. God also raised up, so he goes back into his country and becomes basically a rival to what's going on with Solomon. That, that's our writer's point, is, hey, Dad, here's hey, Dad, this is what happened to him. Uh, so pay attention to that. Genubath uh, is also being raised uh, as possible force as well. It says, God also raised up another adversary to him, Rezon, the son of Eliada, who had fled from his lord Hadadezer, king of Zobah. He gathered men to himself and became leader of a marauding band after David slew them of Zobah, and they went to Damascus and stayed there and reigned in Damascus. So, uh, again, this is a, a refugee of a David 
uh, armed venture up into this neck of the woods up here. This is the area that you would find Zobo if you had a proper map that showed it on there. Uh, so that's, that's the approximate area. And uh, David had come up in here and routed these people. But again, you got a refugee out of that group. And he ends up uh, gathering people to himself and uh, centers himself right here in Damascus and begins to be a rival again with King Solomon. Doesn't agree what's going on. He foments. I don't know what he does, but he makes it more difficult for Solomon to uh, have kind of a, a thoroughgoing reign. So he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon, along with, uh, with the evil that Hadad did, and he abhorred Israel and reigned over Aram. So again, I don't know if I have that on the nick. No, I don't. Uh, so you've got Aram on this end, and Hadad, or not Aram, uh, got to keep my men separate here. A Hadad, uh, forgot his name, Rezin. I knew it would come to me eventually. There it is. Rezin and Hadad. Rezin up here in this area, and Hadad down here. So they're bothering Solomon, making it difficult for him. Uh, and it says he abhorred Israel and reigned over Aram. Then Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraim, Ephraimite of Zeradah, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. So now you've got, you've come through two rivals, uh, uh, Rezon and Hadad, and now you've come to the guy that's really going to be the very focus of the next chapter uh, because he's the guy that actually does tear tribes, ten tribes away from uh, David and Solomon's united Israel. Then Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite from Zeradah, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a wet widow, also rebelled against the king. Now this was the reason why he rebelled against the king. Solomon built the millow and closed up the breach of the city of his father David. Something made him mad about what Solomon had did, had done. Boy, I don't want to start talking that way. Uh, some, he'd gotten angry about how Solomon had built this. And I don't know if you can see it here real well, or you might have to crane your neck around and look at the one on the back. But right about here, our artist has done his favor by responding to that text and just putting a wall right across here. I don't know how much evidence there is for that archaeologically, but it, it does make sense with the scripture. And then here's that terrorist approach that I was telling you about, that he came in and he, he started to basically rebuild this city and then walled off this portion so that you couldn't freely, kind of freely go on up into Jerusalem anywhere you want to. Now you had passageway through this wall that you had to worry about. And apparently, my guess is that uh, Jeroboam and his people... Uh, had property down there somewhere and they didn't like it that they didn't have free access the way they had formerly. Uh, that's the best I can make of it. Oh, I did. I forgot I'd done that. I made you a close-up of it so that you could see it a little bit better. See how that wall goes across right there? So, anyway. Now the man Jeroboam Boam, in spite of his anger with Solomon, he keeps underneath. Now the man Jeroboam was a valiant warrior. And when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he appointed him over the, all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. So the wisest man in the world chooses somebody that's itching to get even. To reign over, rule over all the forced labor. Fascinating. 
It came about at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, or Ahijah, or however you'd like to say that, the Shilonite, found him on the road. And Ahijah had clothed himself with a new cloak, and both of them were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new cloak, which was on him, and tore it into 12 pieces. So uh, Ahijah, the prophet, uh, pulls off this robe, that this new robe that he's bought or had made, and he, he tears it up right there in front of Jeroboam in 12 pieces. So he's real careful. He knows how he's going to do this. He's got, he's got to have 12 when he's done because he's got a purpose here. He said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you 10 tribes. But he will have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the sons of Ammon. And they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and observing my statutes and my ordinances as his father David did. Of the two kings, Solomon and David, who would you say our author thought was the best king? David. David. He obviously thinks David's the best king. Nevertheless, he says, uh, this is continuing with Ahijah's speech, Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler at all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose, who observed my commandments and my statutes. God had made a, com a commitment to David. So uh, he's not going to allow it to go away entirely. And I find this a, a fascinating. When you look at the life of Solomon, and you think about what he did, and, and it's fascinating that, that the scripture never says, well, and Solomon uh, took somebody else's wife, it never says that Solomon wrongly saw to the death of someone else. It never says any of that. It only says that uh, Solomon had a great number of them, and then of wives and, and uh, concubines, and then as he grew older, they got him away from his faith. They got him to looking at other gods and goddesses and so forth. That's what it says about him. But David, who had committed adultery and schemed murder, uh, how is it that you can say that David observes the commandments of God? He was a man after God's own heart. He's a man after God's own heart, yes. He didn't worship other gods. He didn't worship other gods. I think a fair question is, what did David intend to do, and what did David continue intent to intend to do, even when he failed? See? Even when he failed, he kept on intending to be after God. He did not stop. He knew God. He knew who God was. He can read Psalm 51 and get it. You know? He just cries out to God. He's crushed and broken in spirit. And he knows it. He knows he's done wrong. But he's before the living God and presenting himself to God. He's not trying to say, well, you know, I don't even know if I believe in God anymore. I'm going after something else now. That either lust or whatever has led me away. Variety, novelty, whatever has led me away. did not say any of that. Instead, David repents, uh, gets his life straightened out before the Lord, and goes on. So, yes, David is the man after God's own heart, continues after his own heart, even when he has fallen, he gets back up and continues. But I will take, he says, uh, we're in the middle of Ahijah's speech, nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life, the second my servant David, whom I chose, who observed my commandments and my statutes, but I will take the kingdom from his son's hand and give it to you, even ten tribes. But to his son I will give one tribe, 
that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen for myself to put my name there. Uh, is there any let up in God's commitment to have his name in and on the city of Jerusalem? Did God say at one time that he would always have left? He continues to have his name in and on the city of Jerusalem, even at this point. Uh, Solomon's letting down terribly, but uh, he's determined to go forward with his promise and with his purpose. And uh, I would back up here and, and notice something because these kind of things always interest me a little bit. So bear with me. Pick it up if you can get where I'm going here. Uh, there, were, there were how many tribes in Jerusalem? Twelve. Twelve. Twelve or thirteen. There were twelve, strictly speaking. But you always kind of have to say, or thirteen, because Joseph gets his tribe cut in half and you get Ephraim and Manasseh. See? So now you've got, instead of having 12, you actually kind of have 13. So how, I get now that I can have 10, but what happened to the other, how come I've got only one when he says, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save one for, for uh, David's sake in Jerusalem? Well, he's saving Judah, but he also saved Benjamin. So that's, that's two. The other one is, the Levites. The Levites really didn't have a set territory anymore, but they went and lived in cities all around Israel. And if you watch carefully in the things that unfold here with Jeroboam and Rehoboam, you'll see what happens to the Levites, how they respond to the situation that grows, and what, why they end up basically those three... Uh, tribes basically end up uh, in and around Jerusalem. Okay. I will, take the, I will take you and you shall reign over whatever you desire and you shall be king over Israel. Then it will be... I never thought of that connection before. Wow. 12 or 13 tribes and that's kind of how the apostles are too, isn't it? They're kind of 12 or 13. You know, because you have uh, Judas that has to be replaced, and then you have 12 again. Or do you? Because Paul comes along. So, interesting. Yeah, it really could be 14 count Paul. Yeah, it would be 14 count Paul. Count. So, anyway, it's interesting. He is an apostle. Well, yeah, he's an apostle, he's but in a certain sense, because Judas is replaced, mm -hmm. there's, 12 there's 12 again, and then you add Paul. And that's 13. So, it's kind of like 12 or 13. He had to defend himself several times. He put that in the first of scripture. Each book he wrote almost. Yeah, 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 he did. He had to defend his apostleship a lot. Okay. Then it will be that if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. What promises extended to Jeroboam? What's that? So he's going to give him 10 tribes. He's going to give him 10 tribes, and he's actually going to establish an enduring house. In other words, he's going to be able to pass on his kingship to, to his uh, children. Uh, Thus I will afflict the descendants of David for this, but not always. Solomon sought, therefore, to put Jeroboam to death. But Jeroboam arose and fled to Egypt, to Shishak, king of Egypt. And he was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, whatever he did, is wisdom. Are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? Thus the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And I'm done 15 seconds early. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. Bless us, guide us as we leave this house. Help us to understand the Christ connection always. That, that there is repentance and there is mercy and there is, there is great grace in him if we can come after him as he, he bids us do. We pray that you guide us and help us to spread that around in our community, to encourage one another, to encourage our friends and family, to be in the house of the Lord on Sunday and uh, to, to come near to you again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.